الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين طيب so in شاء الله تعالى we we'll look at chapter number 10 باب ما جاء في الرقى والتمام so he says what has been related concerning الرقى protective invocations or prayers for healing and the tamaim, amulets. And the handout I gave you has questions for each section in bold. So you can use those questions um, to kind of guide what we're going to talk about. So basically what I'm going to give you are answers to those questions, inshallah. And if I miss one, just uh, remind me so I can cover it. So the first thing you notice from the chapter heading is that unlike the previous heading where the Imam he said Babu Man Labisa Khaytan I'm sorry Babu Lipsil Khayti Aw what did he say? I'm sorry. He said Babu No. باب من الشرك لبس الحلقة والخيط ونحوهما لرفع البلاء أو دفعه. So he said in that chapter, he said chapter wearing twine, wearing a ring to prevent harm or to repel harm is an act of shirk. So in that particular chapter, you notice that he actually gave a ruling for those actions. But here, he said what has been related concerning a ruqa and a tamahim. And he didn't give a ruling. He didn't call a ruqa shirk. He didn't call a tamahim shirk. Why is that? The answer is because not all of a ruqa, these protective invocations or, or these prayers for healing, and not all tamaim, not all amulets, are shirk. So this is important to note. That the reason why he didn't give an unequivocal ruling when it relates to a ruqa and tamaim, like he did for wearing rings and twine, etc., <coughs> is because they are not unequivocally, un you know, without condi unconditionally shirk. But there are some types of ruqa that are shirk, some types of tamaim that are shirk, and some types which are, which are not shirk. So they are from a ruqya or from a ruqa. We're going to come to know that there are ruqa which are legislated, they are shari'iya, and there are ruqa which are not legislated, ghir, shari'iya. And we're going to learn about tamaim, that there is a specific type of tamaim, a specific type of tamima, which is not shirk, and that is the tamima which is from the Quran. And we're going to talk about that in detail, inshallah, today. And it's important to know with respect to a, tami, a tamaim that none of the preceding scholars has held that charms from the Quran are a form of shirk, although they have differed regarding their permissibility. So it's important that when it comes to a tamaim in the Quran, none of the previous scholars, none of the early scholars, none of them, none of them call the tamaim in the Quran. Shirkan. All right. So the Imam he begins this chapter with the Hadith, the Hadith of Abi Bashir al Ansari, in which Abi Bashir he says, and it was collected by Bukhari Muslim. He says, "أنه كان مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في بعض أسفاره، فأرسل رسولا أن لا يبقينا في رقبة بعيرا." قلادة قلادة من وتر أو قلادة إلا قطيات أن لا يبقين في رقبة بعير قلادة من وتر أو قلادة إلا قطيات So he said that he was with the messenger of Allah on one of his journeys whereupon he صلى الله عليه وسلم sent a messenger to proclaim let there not be a guard I'm sorry let there not let not a garden from silk or any other type of garden remain 
round the neck of a camel, except it is removed. So as we mentioned, this hadith is called the Bukhan Muslim. And the question comes, why did the Prophet ﷺ order that these gardens be removed? The answer is because the people were taking them as a cause, a means, a sabab, to procure benefit or repel harm. And they are not a legitimate cause to repel, to repel harm or procure benefit. And thus they violate the principle that we've been studying for the last two or three weeks, that whenever we take something as a cause for benefit or to repel harm, then it has to be supported by either the sharia, the delir, or has to be supported by what clinical tests. And anytime we take something as a cause to bring about benefit or repel harm, and we don't have either one of those two proofs, then it becomes what? It becomes an act of shirk. Could be shirk akbar, could be shirk azkhar. And so in this way, these garlands that they were hanging around like necks of camels were similar to what? Were similar to tamayim, were similar to what? Amulets. And have the same ruling as amulets. As the Prophet said in the hadith, مَنْ عَلَّقَ تَمِيمَةً فَقَدْ مَنْ عَلَّقَ تَمِيمَةً فَقَدْ أَشْرَقْ Whoever uh, wears a talisman or an amulet has committed a shirk. So that's the first hadith. The second hadith was narrated on the authority of Ibn Mas'ud. Who said that he heard the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam? He heard him say, Inna ruqa wa tama'ima wa tiwalata shirkun. So he heard the Prophet sallallahu say, Verily, a ruqa, which is protective invocations, a tama'im, amulets, and a tiwala, spells, are forms of shirk. So now we're going to focus our attention on one of those, which is a ruqa. We're going to focus our attention on one of those that he mentioned. He mentioned three things, a ruqa, protective invocations, a tama'im, amulets, and finally a tiwala, spells. We're going to focus our attention on one of them, which is a ruqa. A ruqa, ikhwani wa khawati, are two types. There are two types of ruqa. The first one is legal or sanctioned. Legal or sanctioned. Those which what? Are allowed by Islam, permitted by Islam, legal or sanctioned. The second type is illegal or not sanctioned. Illegal or not sanctioned. So two types of ruqa. One of them, legal, sanctioned. Second one, illegal, not sanctioned. طيب. How will we know the first one? Because if we know the first one, then we'll know the second one. So Ibn Hajar al fat he mentions that our ruqa are legal, sanctioned, permitted in Islam if three conditions are met. If three conditions are met, then the ruqya that a person uses is a legal and permitted ruqya in Islam. And we talk about ruqya, we're talking about like what the Prophet used to do when he would cup his hands before he would sleep. And he would blow into his hands, and he would recite the last three surahs of the Qur'an. Then he would blow again and wipe himself from head to toe. This is a type of what? Ruqya, right? So we have Ruqya that the people used to do in Jahiliya before the Prophet came. And people continue to, to do uh, Ruqya, they continue to do these prayers for healing, even to this day. And some of them are what? Legislated, they're allowed, and some of them are not what? Legislated. How do we differentiate? Ibn Hajjah said there's three conditions, that if a rupiah has these conditions, if it meets these prerequisites, then it'll be what? It'll be permissible. And he says, it will be permissible be ijma' al-ulama, that the scholars are agreed that if all these three conditions are met, and all these prerequisites are fulfilled, the rupiah will be what? It'll be legislated, it'll be legal, it'll be sanctioned by Islam. Tayyip, what's the first condition? The first condition is that the rupiah consist of the speech of Allah, the words of Allah, like the Qur'an, or his names, or his attributes. So if we have a rupiah which comprises, which is made up of Qur'an, purely Qur'an, Surah Al-Fatiha, Ayat Al-Kursi, the last three surahs of the Qur'an, then that will be what? A legal, legislated rupiah. Or it could be what? Asma'illah. It could be his names. 
Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Ghafoor, Al-Tawwab, could be his names. Could be what? His attributes. Any one of those, if it's any one of those, it'll be what? Legal and legislative. Secondly, the second condition is that it be in Arabic or in any other language provided that it is understood by the one using it and or the one upon whom it is used. So, the rupiah has to either be in Arabic or in any language understood by the one who is using the rupiah and or the one it's being used on. You guys follow that? So basically the person who makes rupiah, he could say it in Urdu. Provided what? That he understands Urdu. Or if he's reading it on someone else, that person who he's reading on has to understand Urdu. Could be far, uh, Farsi. Right? Because he, he could do it in Farsi. The language of what? Persia. He could he can make rupiah that, no problem. As long as he understands it and the person he he reads on understands it. So it has to be in a language yufham ma'naha. Has to be fi lughatin yufham ma'naha. It has to be in a language understood by what? The one using it and the one it's used on. But the third condition, that one not believe that it can benefit, this rupiah can benefit or harm in of itself independent independently or in spite of Allah's will. So it's critical that we believe that the rupiah is what? It is a tool, it's a mechanism, it's a means, but it can't do anything by itself. It does it by Allah's will. It prevents harm, it brings about benefit, it cures, it heals by Allah's will, not by itself. So those are the three conditions. First one has to be from Allah's words, the Qur'an, His names, or His sifat, His qualities, attributes. Has to be in a language understood by the one using it and being the one it's being used on. And finally, the person who uses it cannot believe that it helps or harms, or prevents harm, I should say, in and of itself. Whenever all of these three conditions are met, the scholars are agreed that the rupiah is what? Is legal legislated and sanctioned by Islam. So a person can use a protective invocation, he can use a prayer for healing, provided that all these three conditions are met. However, if one of these conditions is not met, what will be the ruling? Will it automatically be unacceptable? Will it automatically be illegal? طيب. Let's go one condition at a time. Suppose the Rupiah was in Arabic or a language which is understood and the person did not believe it could benefit by itself but it wasn't from Allah's words his names or his attributes so that condition was missing could that Rupiah be acceptable the scholars have different the scholars have different about this some of them say yes and some of them say no. Okay? Some permit it and some don't permit it. Okay? Alright. So I'm going to tell you what they said and then we'll come back and see what you say now. Alright. Some of them, they said it's permissible. As long as the other two conditions are, are present. Language understood and you don't believe it benefits by itself. But it doesn't have to be this. It doesn't have to be from Allah's words, His names, His attributes. And they say the proof for this is every hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ gave consent to the people who had recently come to Islam from Jahiliyyah to use those ruqa, those prayers of, for healing and those invocations for protection that they had used prior to embracing Islam. So as we said previously, the people before the Prophet came, they had ruqa. They had these ruqa. They had these protective in invocations that they would, they would use, right? Mm -hmm. And we have a hadith where the Prophet would do what? Would consent for them to continue to use those ruqa. So for example, we have the hadith of Awf ibn Malik, collected by Muslim. In that hadith, the hadith of Awf ibn Malik, 
he said that the Prophet ﷺ said, "U'rudu alayya ruqaqum, la ba'sa bil ruqa ma lam takun shirkan." He told the people, he said, "Present to me your ruqa. Let me hear these ruqa, these invocations that you make for healing and to protect yourselves. Let me hear them. Let me hear what they consist of. Let me see what you say." There is nothing wrong with invocations for protection and prayers for healing, provided that they do not contain any idolatry. Meaning, if you read to me a ruqya and doesn't contain any idolatry, I'll do what? I'll approve it. That's what the Prophet is saying. Even though they weren't from what? From Allah's words or his names and attributes. طيب. Another hadith. A hadith also collected by Muslim authority of Jabir. And this hadith, Jabir narrates, and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqarra ala Amr ibn Hazm. He says that the Prophet permitted the clan of Amr ibn Hazm to continue to use the ruqya that they used to use before what? Before Islam. He continued to let them use them. Why? Because it didn't contain any shirk. Another proof that these scholars they give is they said that we have a general principle that says anything that it is confirmed that it's what? Beneficial. Once we confirm its benefit, its usefulness, its utility, then what? We can take advantage of it. And they say, so if there's a rupiah that proves beneficial and has proved beneficial for people, it doesn't contain the idolatry, there's no problem in what? In taking advantage of it, benefiting from it. So if the first condition, what this means here, Khwani, is that if the first condition is not from the law of speech, not from his Quran, not from his names and attributes, if that condition is missing, but the other two conditions are there, the ruqya can be what? Accepted. Suppose one of the other two conditions wasn't there. So it was in a language that couldn't be understood. Could we accept that ruqya? No. Couldn't accept it. We couldn't accept it because there's no way for us to know for sure that doesn't contain what? Shirk. So somebody, and this is the thing too, Yekhwani, people will tell you that they go, for example, in some of the Muslim countries, They'll go to someone because they have some illness, some ailment. And they have these, um, these people who are like, um, like medicine men. And they practice like a natural medicine, if you will, and a, or a spiritual medicine, if you will. So they'll go to these people. They'll go to these people, and these people will do what? They'll give them a tamima. And they'll write some things. And in many cases, they'll write something, the person who goes to them is illiterate. They don't know what's written in there. And they'll take advantage of it and use it. And then ultimately they'll, ex they'll show it to someone who actually can read and decipher. And it'll turn out to have what? It'll turn out to have something which is what? Shirki. Something which has what? Idolatry, maybe seeking refuge with the jinn or something to this effect. So this is something which happens in Hawaii. So it's incumbent that the person who's going to use the rupiah, they have to know what? They have to know the language that's being spoken or being used in the Ruqya to ward off and to avoid what? Avoid it containing what? Shirk. So that condition has to be there. And the last one has to be there as well. Because as soon as a person believes that something can benefit you or harm you independently in spite of Allah, they fall into what? A Shirk. Nothing happens except by Allah's will. That's a fundamental that cannot be what? That cannot be avoided. There's no way around it. Right? So, out of the three conditions, the first one is the one that what? Does not have to necessarily be fulfilled in every rupiah, but the other two have to be fulfilled for the rupiah to be what? To be sharia, to be legislated, legal, and sanctioned. طيب. Then the next uh, hadith is the hadith, let's see. طيب. The next one is a hadith of Abdullah ibn Ukim, in which he relates that the Prophet ﷺ, or he actually attributed to the Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever hangs the hadith of Abdullah ibn Ukim, he said that the Prophet ﷺ said, Man ta'allaqa shay'an wukila, wukila ilay. Whoever hangs something around his neck or elsewhere for protection or treatment will be entrusted to it. He will be entrusted to it. He will be to it. Alright, so he says, Allah Hang something. 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 Hang something.
hang something. What he means is not he hangs something regardless of his intention, but rather he means he hangs something while believing that it will benefit or repel harm in spite of Allah's will. So for example, if I hang a picture, I'm not what? Committing what? Shirk. And this hadith is not applicable. So the Prophet when he says, Allah shay'an, he means what? You hang it with a particular intention. What's your intention? Either to what? To repel some harm or procure some some benefit. So that's the intention behind what? Ta'allaqa shay'an. I'm sorry, ta'allaqa shay'an. Oh, I'm sorry, ta'allaqa shay'an. Then he says, wukila ilay. What does this mean? We'll be entrusted to it. We'll be entrusted to it. Tayyib. If he puts his trust that he relies on this what? This amulet or this charm to protect him or to bring about some benefit, then instead of being considered a muwahid, the one who relies purely and solely on who? Allah. He'll be considered what? A mushrik. Who what? Who relies on other than Allah and therefore Allah will leave him to what? To fend for himself or will entrust him to what? To those idols and partners for what? To seek what? To seek help from the partner that he ascribed to Allah. So instead of Allah helping him in what? Entrust him to do what? To seek help from the partner he ascribed to Allah. So that's basically what wukila ilay, wukila ilay means. Fine. Then the shaykh, he starts to explain each of the meanings of, or sorry, explain in detail the three terms which were used in this chapter. at tamaim Amulets, Arruqa, these prayers for invocation and healing, and Atiwala, which is basically a spell. So the first one he says, Atama'im, refers to something placed around the necks of children to protect them from the effects of the evil eye. However, if the amulet was from the Quran, some of the Salaf, pious predecessors, permitted its use while others did not permit it and considered it equally prohibited. Ibn Mas'ud was among those who disapproved of Tama'im from the Qur'an. Okay, so this little paragraph is pretty beneficial, has a lot of beneficial points, and we'll take them one by one. The first thing is that he said that Tama'im refers to something placed around the necks of children to protect them from the effects of the evil eye. So this here, Yahuan, is a definition of a Tama'im by example. So we have to understand that this is not the only type of tamima, something you hang around the neck of a child, but it could be hung around the neck of an, of an adult. It could be hung around the neck of a camel, as we saw when the Prophet said that we should cut off these what? These garlands, which are a type of tamima. So this is just an example that the Shia gives, not to say that they're exclusively or exclusively limited to, they're exclusive to or limited to this definition, but it's just an example. Okay? Then he says, However, if the amulet was from the Qur'an, some of the Salaf permitted its use, while others did not permit it. Okay, so what does that teach you right away? Straight away, what do you learn from that? He says, some of the Salaf permitted it, some of the Salaf didn't want, didn't permit it. So right away, what do we learn from that? We learn three things. The first thing, al-khilaf sa'il, that differing in this issue is what? Permitted. There are some issues in Islam, Yahuan, Yahuat, you can't differ about them. For example, is Allah one? It's not permissible for us, the Muslims to differ about that. Where is Allah? It's not permissible for Muslims to differ about that. But there are some issues in Islam where Muslims can want. They're permitted to differ because the, the Salaf themselves, the early Muslims themselves, differed about it. So, for example, did the Prophet see Allah when he made al Miraj, when he went to the heavens? The early Muslims differed about that. So Muslims nowadays could what? Differ about it. That doesn't mean that there's not a right opinion, but since the early Muslims differed, the later Latter-day Muslims can what? Can differ as well, and no one can do what? Which is the second point. No one can make tashniya. No one can degrade, vilify, belittle, uh, hold in contempt the one who holds the other, the other view. We can't make tashniya on the one who doesn't agree with us in this issue, as long as he what, holds one of the opinions which are acceptable. Okay? And the third thing we learn is that it's not correct to say about a tama'im from the Qur'an that they are shirk. 
it's not correct to say about the tamam from the quran that they are shirk why because the early muslims did not say that they stopped short of saying that some of them said permissible some of them said impermissible but none of them said what none of them said shirk so it's not permissible to come after them and say something they didn't say as imam ahmad used to say Imam. He used to say, don't speak about an issue where you don't have what? An Imam, a predecessor, a Salaf. Don't say something and you don't have someone before you who said the same thing. And he used to say, people would come to him and say, what do you think about a person who holds an opinion that the Sahaba never held? Or they differed in an issue and he held an opinion other than the opinions that they held. So Muhammad would get upset and he would say, Hada Hada Awl Khabith. Hadihi Bid'a. He would say, This is a foul thing. That someone would hold an opinion that they didn't hold. This is an innovation. This is what he would say. Rahimahullah ta'ala. So we have to be very careful about what saying something that the early Muslims did not did not say. Tayyip. Um, let's talk a little bit about these opinions because the Shaykh. He mentions how many opinions? He says some of them permitted it and some of them didn't permit it. How, how many is that? There's actually three. There's actually three opinions. The first opinion is that these tamahim from the Quran are absolutely prohibited. Under no uncertain terms should anyone use a tamima from the Quran. And this opinion is attributed to Ibn Mas'ud and his colleagues and pupils, Ashabu and Uqwat ibn Amr. Another one of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu. Unfortunately, though, there is no authentic chain from them. There's nothing authentic that actually connects it or attributes it to them. People have said, have told us that that was the opinion of Mas'ud. But the chains going back to Mas'ud and Uqbat ibn Amr are not what? Are not authentic, they're not connected. But this was also the opinion of latter day scholars from what? Al Hanabila from the Hanabilas, the Hanbalis, and also the scholars of Ad-Da'wah and Najdiya Salafiyya, the scholars of the Najdi Salafi Da'wah, like uh, Ash-Shaykh al-Imam Muhammad al-Wahhab and his wa, his descendants, and those who want follow his madad. Tayyip, number two, the second opinion, absolutely permitted. You can do it. It's from the Quran, you can do it. And this has been attributed to Abdullah ibn Amr. This opinion has been attributed to Abdullah ibn, ibn Amr. Al-As, ibn Al-As. But the chain of this athar, the chain attributing it to Abdullah ibn Amr, is a weak chain. As mentioned by Al-Bani, who researched the chain back to Abdullah ibn Amr, ibn Al-As, and he said that this chain contains Muhammad ibn Ishaq, who was a Wudalis. Wudalis means somebody who they use the word an, and give the impression that they heard it from the person directly, but they really didn't hear it from them directly. So once that becomes exposed about a person, they have to actually say, Qala, Akhbara, okay, Akhbarani, Qala li, Haddathani. They have to actually say, he told me, he narrated to me, he said to me. If they don't use those specific words indicating they actually heard it, we can't accept their hadith. And when he narrated this hadith, or this ethar from Abdullah ibn Amr, he used what? An, on the authority of, from. Okay, but that doesn't mean you heard it from him. Maybe you heard it from someone else. So that chain is weak. So we don't have it authentically narrated um, from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Laos. But the third opinion is that the ruling depends. Now we don't say absolutely permitted. We don't say absolutely prohibited. But the ruling depends. Depends on what? Depends on when the tamima was used. When it was used. So this group of scholars, they say, if a person uses a tamima before they get afflicted by something, it's not permissible. But if they use it after they get afflicted, it becomes what? It becomes permissible. It becomes permitted. And this opinion was narrated by Al-Bihaqi on the authority of Aisha. Al-Bihaqi on the authority of Aisha with an authentic chain. And be happy on the authority of Aisha with authentic chain. And this was the view held by Ahmed and the opinion preferred by Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al Qayyim, and Ibn Abdul Bar. Right? So, three opinions, all of them related 
or attributed to what? Companions. But only one attributed authentically, and that's the last one. So pay attention to that. And then, I don't want to get too technical. I'll tell you what. Do you guys think we should stop? Is it too, too heavy? Or can we go on? Go on? Bye. All right. So we have these three opinions. Now, the first opinion, Abdurrahman ibn Hassan, he gave three arguments to support the first opinion. The opinion that what? That it's absolutely pro prohibited. He gave three justifications for it, three arguments that he used to say, hey, no one should be doing this. The first one he said was that all the text which talk about a tamatim are aham. They're general. They're general texts. And therefore, they encompass every type of tamima you can imagine, whether it's from the Quran or not from the Quran. Okay? So he says, um, he says that because the texts are so what? General. It includes what? Any type of tamima. And there's no way that you can make an exception for the what? For the tamim from the Quran. But other scholars, they answered, and they said that those ahadith, those nusus, they all talk about the tamima as being what? Shirk. Right? So, for example, من علق تميمة فقد أشرق the hadith of Mas'ud, that whoever uh, wears or hangs an amulet has committed what? A shirk. So these uh, athar that you're talking about, I'm sorry, these ahadith that you talk about, they all refer to what? Tamam al-shirk. And we know that those ahadith don't what? Include the tamam from the Qur'an. Why? Because no one ever called the tamam from the Qur'an shirk. So they say that this am, these general texts, in reality the Prophet meant something specific. He meant those tamam which are not from, not from the Qur'an. So that's how they answer the first one. They say it's not included by the generality of the text because why? We know for certain that the Tamam from the Quran are not, not shirk. But the second thing that Abdurrahman ibn Hassan said to support the first view, he says precautionary. What we call sadda thariya. That basically something might not be haram, but we leave it because it could lead to haram. He says, how can it lead to haram? He says, the person will start out using the tamam from the Quran, and then pretty soon he'll be using the tamam from other than what? Other than the Quran. So he starts out using the tamam from the Quran, and then what? He ends up what? Using tamatim from other than the Quran, so it will lead to that. So one thing leads to another. So if we just ban it all together, we don't have to worry about people what? Starting out with the Quran tamatim and then leading to what? The other ones. So those scholars who hold the other view, they said, well, the problem with that is that if we say that about tamatim, we have to say the same thing about what? Ruqa. Because you have ruqya, which is from what? From the Quran. You have ruqya, which is not from the Quran. So if we say, that we shouldn't do the ones that are not from the Qur'an because it could lead to... I'm sorry, we shouldn't use the ones from the Qur'an because it could lead to the ones that are not from the Qur'an and the ones that contain shirk. Then we have to say the same thing about what? ar So they say, if we say no, we use the ones which are permissible, whether they're from the Qur'an or not from the Qur'an, they say the same thing is true about what? About a tamam. That we can use a tamam from what? From the Qur'an. Just like we use the ruqya from the Qur'an. So they say basically that if we say that about tamatim, we have to say the same thing about a ruqya. But whereas ruqya, we do what? We differentiate. So the same thing is true about what? A tamatim. We legalize the one from the Qur'an. We don't legalize the one that's not from the Qur'an. Okay? So that's, that's the second answer that they give as far as taking as a precautionary measure. The last one is that those scholars who hold that view, they say, well, look, if you start wearing these tamatim from the Qur'an, Right? You have a tamima that has, for example, ayat al-kursi, right? Or qul huwa ahad, or something else from the names of Allah. And then you are walking around with it all the time, pretty soon you do what? You walk into the, to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. You'll take it to the bathroom. You'll be exposing, you know, the names of Allah, the mention, the, the dhikr of Allah. You'll be exposing to what? To filth and foul things, etc. So you run the risk of what? Of degrading the Qur'an degrading the Qur'an, or degrading the dhikr of Allah, right? And those scholars who all the other few said, or they answered it and said, 
They said, well, it's quite possible that the person when he goes in the bathroom will do what? Will just take it off. He'll remember to take it off. And they also said that even if he didn't remember, the scholars of Islam have differed historically, traditionally. They have differed, I'm sorry, throughout the, um, yeah, throughout the centuries they've differed about whether or not taking something which has the mention of Allah, okay, the name of Allah or some of his ayat, taking it to the bathroom, is it permissible or impermissible? The scholars have differed about that. It's not something they've agreed upon, that they've differed about whether or not that's permissible. As long as it's, what, it's protected from what? From filth. Can it be entered into the bathroom? The first had a ring that said, for example, um, I don't know, it said uh, Bismillah, for example. Or he had a tamima that said, a necklace that said that, or something to this effect. Or he had a mushaf in his what? In his pocket. He feared if he left it outside, someone might take it. Could he take it to the Quran? The scholars are different about that. Traditionally, they're different about that. And among the scholars who held that it was permissible are Ibn Sirin, Ibn Sirin, and uh, and a shabi, they held that what it's permissible as long as what's protected from what actually touching or being touched by the filth. So there's something which is what there's a difference of opinion. Aslan, the scholar said, okay. So that's how they answer those um, arguments used to support what the first the first view. Then the sheikh he goes on to talk about al ruqa He gives a paragraph about them and he says, al ruqa are also referred to as azaim. The proof texts have authorized those which are free of a shirk. Case in point, the Messenger of Allah allowed using these healing prayers to fight the effects of the evil eye and the sting of poisonous insects. All right? So he said the proof texts have authorized, they've allowed the use of ruqa, and the proof for that um, is the statement that we mentioned, or the hadith we mentioned earlier, the hadith of Malik, urdu alayya ruqakum. Um, present to me your ruqya, present to me your um, prayers for healing. All right, then he said to fight the effects of the evil eye and the sting of poisonous insects. Again, that's what that's saying that this is the best thing, this is the preferred usage, but not the only usage. They can be used for what many other, many other, other things. Then the sheikh he gives what an explanation of a tiwala. What's a tiwala? He says, is something that those experienced in bewitchment do. Claiming that it can cause a woman to be more beloved to her husband and a husband more beloved to his wife. So basically what they do is for Tiwala, let's say a woman fears that her husband has lost interest in her. And that he may marry another woman or he may just divorce her. So she may go to one of these um, sorcerers or spellcasters and say, I want a Tiwala for my husband. So he'll become madly in love with me, obsessed with me, he won't divorce me. Well, then, and then that... Um, spellcaster will do what? Will cast a spell. Okay? And so the people believe that what? These spells had what? They had the ability to what? To protect them from this harm or bring about this benefit that they saw. That's what he, that's what a tiwala is. And therefore a tiwala is a form of what? Not just shit, but a form of magic. And sorcery. We know magic and sorcery are what? Impermissible. But, um, then he closes with a few ahadith, a few narrations. He says, Imam Ahmed is never on authority of Wayfair. Who said the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, "Oruwayfa, it may be that you will live a long time after me. So inform the people that whoever ties a knot in his beard, places a charm around his neck, or after relieving himself cleanses himself with animal dung or a bone, then Muhammad has renounced him. Muhammad has renounced him. So he says, place the charm around his neck again, talking about what tamima, and then he said Muhammad has renounced him. So what does that tell you?" First of all, when he says renounce him, he says what? I'm, it, basically, the prophet saying what? I'm free of him. I declare myself free of him and his act. I denounce him, right? I, I have nothing to do with him. And that automatically tells you that whatever he's doing must be haram, must, be not, must not be permissible. Why would the prophet free himself of someone who's doing something which is what? Allowed. So the very first thing we know from this hadith is that whatever the person is doing, when he's hanging these tamaim, he's doing something which is not permitted. But in addition to that, it's not just impermissible, it's what? An act of shirk. It's an act of shirk because we have the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, Man Alaqa Tamim al Ashrak. Whoever hangs an amulet or a charm has committed a shirk. Okay? And that's because the one who wears it, we mentioned the qa'idah, he thinks that the thing that he's wearing can bring about benefit or repel some harm. Then the Imam, he closes with some athar, 
The first one is the Athar of Sayyid ibn Jubair, in which he said, whoever removed an amulet worn by something, I'm sorry, worn by someone by cutting it. So the person is wearing an amulet, you come and you do what? You cut it. His act would be similar in reward to that of freeing a slave. And that just goes to show you how, one, how serious this is and how a person should be very keen to what? To um, fight a shirk and to um, rid, a sh rid um, himself and others of what? Of a shirk to the point that he, what? he cuts it. He doesn't say, could you remove that gently? No, he, what? he cuts it. He damages it. He ruins it. Makes it lose its utility. He cuts it. And uh, also, um, how significant this act is in the sight of Allah, except that this effort is not what? It's not authentic. Okay, so that would be the meaning, that would be the benefit of the effort if it were if it were authentic. And the last one he mentioned is on the authority of Ibrahim al nakhai that he said, they, meaning the peoples of Ibn Mas'ud, Ashabu, used to prohibit amulets from the Quran and other than the Quran. And he used the word um, yakrahun, kanu yakrahun, they used to um, literally dislike, that's how we translate it. But the actual meaning is what they used to forbid. Because the early Muslims, they used to use the word karaha with the meaning of what? Al-hurma. So whenever they would say, um, akrahu dhalik, I, what we would translate as dislike, they actually meant what? I what? I prohibit. I prohibit it. And that's one of the dangers of what? Using latter day usages to interpret the meanings intended by what? Earlier generations. Because as time goes, the usage changes, the way that people use things change, and we have to be mindful of that so that we don't what? Misconstrue what they intended. So for example, the fuqaha, they have a tendency to say uh, yukra, or they say, for example, have the makruh, they say this is disliked, and what they mean, or they say makruh, and what they mean by that is disliked. It's not prohibited. And then people will take that meaning, which is common amongst the fuqaha, especially the latter-day fuqaha, and they'll apply to what? What the early Muslims used to say when they would say, yukra. And I think that's one of the problems with, for example, the, the Hanafi madhab. Is that Abu Hanifa would say something is what? Makruh. And the latter-day scholars would interpret it in light of what? How they understood makruh. Disliked. Whereas Abu Hanifa would mean what? Prohibited. <coughs> and that's why they came up with what? These different types of makru. They say, for example, makru tanzi or makru tahrim. They come up with different levels because they say, man, it can't be makru because the adilla indicates what? Haram. But the imam says it's makru. So they say, oh, there must be different types of makru. No. When the imam used makru back then, he meant what? Haram. He meant haram, right? But people get confused because they look at it in light, they look at it from their own lens or the lens of what? Their contemporary age, instead of looking at it from what? The age in which it was what? Used. When the Imam used it, attention. And the way that people use it in that time, they have a different attention. <coughs> but finally, um, this ethic that the pupils of Ibn Mas'ud used to prepare the Amish from the Quran is also not authentic. And that's why we have the problem with the first, uh, remember we said there were three opinions about these uh, Tama'im. And it's been attributed to Mas'ud, but it's not been attributed with what? With authentic, authentic change. That he used to prohibit and his companions, his ashab, used to prohibit as well. So that's basically um, the commentary on the chapter. Are there any questions? Any questions? Going once. Going twice. <laughs> nah. The Prophet has two children. Two grandchildren. Did he have, <coughs> did he have two grandchildren? Hassan al Hussein. Hey. Did he use to put Quran in him or he used to read only? Um there's no uh, there's nothing from the Prophet that he hung anything on, on anyone. So does hey. the hadith say Khairul Huda Huda Muhammad? Akid. So. But if the companions if they do something, especially if they do something that becomes common knowledge then their action is actually a hujjah. Their action is a hujjah for a number of reasons. One, they can't agree upon dalala. If one of them does something and it becomes common knowledge you did not and there's no nakir, and there's no nakir, there is no. there's no nakir, they do something and there's no nakir, there's no one who contends and say, hey, 
the this is wrong. You think that there's uh, the Salafis about three or two opinions about it, so we did not have Ijma on it. No, no, we didn't say there's Ijma. But what we so say is that. that mean if there is no Ijma, then mm -hmm. it's, it's not totally agreement about that this has been done. Why yeah. we don't do what the Prophet did? Why you do command the Kalimat in the Hitam and the Kulishat and Muhammad and you would follow the Nas and them? This was the Prophet did. So this is more yeah. stronger even than we say in the sum of the Sahaba did. And who are the Sahaba who, who agree about it? We know that Ibn Mas'ud, uh, there is a possibility that narration is not that authentic. So yeah. who are the names that we have that they, they did such a thing? Okay. You, you want me to respond now? Of course. I'm, this is the reason I'm quiet. <laughs> But, all right, so, like we said, there are three opinions, and each opinion has been attributed to a Sahabi, at least one Sahabi. In the case of the ones who said absolutely prohibited, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and the Uqbat ibn Amr. But the problem is that we have no authentic chain to, to either one of them. So we can't confirm that, in fact, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud or Uqbat ibn Amr, they held this opinion. It's just been attributed to them. Without what? Without an authentic chain. But, and say the same thing uh, regarding the second opinion, which is it's absolutely permitted, which is the opinion which is attributed to Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al -As. And you know al Albani, he discussed this uh, narration and he mentions that it contains Muhammad ibn Ishaq, who is Mudallis. So we can't accept that either. We have the attribution, but we have nothing authentic to confirm that Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al actually used to do what? used to put a tamaim on his children, which is what it's been said. But we have on the authority of Aisha, the third opinion, which is that if it is, uh, if it's done before the bala, before the person gets ill or is afflicted by whatever they're trying to what, cure themselves of, it's not permitted. But if it's done after that, it's permitted. And this particular, this particular opinion has been authentically narrated in the authority of Aisha by Bayhaqi. So the Senate is Sahih. So now, if we look at it, we have basically an ether from Aisha permitting it, permitting it under certain circumstances. And we have nothing from the other companions authentic that prohibits it. So when we don't have, when we don't have the Quran prohibiting it, absolutely. The Sunnah prohibiting it, absolutely. And we have, huh? Hey. And that's, yeah, we answer that. We answer that because هذا عام يريد به, I'm sorry, يريد به الخصوص. Okay, this is عام يريد به الخاص or يراد به الخاص. This is an عام, a general, which we know. That what's intended by is something specific, what and that is what. Be, what's he, when you go to the bathroom, as an example, what's he going to do? With and that's a bathroom? good. That's that's something we also mentioned. Let me come back to the one you just said. Though. Let me finish with that one. So we know that this am it is man That's am. It includes every tamima. Okay, but the problem with that is that we know for certain that this is an am that the prophet intended by its general, but he intended by something. He intended by something specific. Why? Because none of the scholars have ever held that the tamima from the Quran is what is shirk. So when the Prophet said, "Man alaqa tamimatan," it's as if he it's as if he said, "Man alaqa tamimatan min ghir al-Quran faqad ashshak." Okay, we know, for example, because, yani, without exception, the scholars do not say that the tamim from the Quran is shirk. So that's with respect to an umum. Then the last thing is, what about the bathroom? What about the bathroom? If a person is wearing this tamima, it's likely that he'll take it into the bathroom and then the Qur'an or the dhikr of Allah would be yumtahan. Uh, and the answer that the scholars have given to that is that they said, is that they said that the person who wears the tamima before he goes to the bathroom, he might walk, might take it off. So what if it's a little kid? And if it's a little kid, he might go ahead and go in there and do it. But then the scholars have said, even this is a mess and a muhtalifun fiha. It's an issue which the scholars differ about. Whether or not just going into the bathroom with a tamima is what? Is an is 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 
is an act which is degrading to the Quran or not permissible. And the reason why they say this is because scholars have differed traditionally, historically, about whether or not this is permitted or not permitted. And they give the example of Ibn Sirin and a Sha'bi who permitted, who considered permissible to what? To take something which has the dhikr of Allah into the khala. So that's how they answer that. Now there's no question, Ya Khwan, that the safest thing, as mentioned by Sa'di, as Sa'di mentioned his Qawlu Sadiq, he said, Al Awla Tarkuha. He said, the best thing is what? To leave these tamayim. The best thing to do is what? To leave them. Right? Well, why would you want to say this is the best thing so to be in the safe side? Because There's no, I just said it, Ya Sheikh. I just said it. And if I forgot to say it in the, in the talk, I just forgot. You see, because now, hey. it, it, now the person, hey. instead of trusting on Allah, he's just trusting. I know that is what's written from the Quran. Uh -huh. But now he did not even think about the Quran. He's thinking about this thing that he has it. To such a degree, hey. if he fall asleep without having it or go out of his house, he taking a shower and forgot to put it on. Now he rushed back to get it because now became all his independence is not about Allah, eh? it's about what he is hanging. Eh? So this is leading to some kind of trusting in a thing. Eh? Doesn't matter what's in it. Eh? So, so, uh, so it would be better that instead of giving eh? all these things that we tell the people, why you understand? Eh? Leave all this alone because. It may lead, especially living in a society that is not pure to heed and all these things, it's hey. got things, it's got to fix. SubhanAllah. Taiba, there's no question, Ya Sheikh, uh, that what you're saying right now is one of the arguments used by the people who say that we should not use any type of tamim whatsoever. And there's no, what you're saying is 100% right. The best thing is to leave it. And even, like I said, uh, scholars like Asadi, they mentioned that. I guess my whole purpose here is to teach the material in the most well-rounded and thorough way possible to avoid one of the byproducts of just giving one opinion or just giving part of the argument. One of the byproducts of that is intolerance. So then when people come in contact with people who hold a different opinion, they begin to start um, making judgments on them, casting judgments on them, categorizing them, labeling them in a way which is what? Improper. And also that it creates what? A nufra. So what I try to do is basically expose the people to what? The discussion as thoroughly as possible. If there is room for a difference of opinion, I want to let people know that so that they don't become intolerant. That's my key thing because one of the things that happens and has happened um, historically is that people tell people, because and they have good intentions, we just want to protect the people from being confused or going into error, which is what you mentioned. And so we just tell them one thing. But then they come to think that, what? Well, that's the only thing. That's the only way. This is the only right way. And then what happens is that when they get exposed to something else, then the person who follows the other view is a mubtadi, he's bad, he's this, he's this, and this, and this is a, this is also a waqi' that we live in. So that's my whole intention. But at the same time, what you're saying is 100% right in the sense that the best thing is what? Is to leave the tama'im from what? The Qur'an. To leave them all together because, as you said, the Prophet didn't do it. And people could easily not know some of these dhawabits, some of these particulars, and then start what? Start doing it without following these particulars and they could actually fall into what? Into mistakes, into error. But again, the whole purpose of mentioning what was said, um, what the arguments are, how scholars have answered those arguments is so that people become what? They become tolerant. Not so that they start using tamat from the Quran. That's not the intention. Don't forget, always keep in mind that we are in Colombia, South Carolina. Hey, eh. so I have to learn that. I have to learn that because, and I, and you do have to adjust. I give you that. That's one hundred percent true. You have to adjust to the audience. To the audience. To the audience. There's no this, question. This my main question. And it takes, it takes time to adjust. Yeah. But I'm open to adjusting. Jazakallah khairan. Jazakallah. I'm not stubborn. Wallahi, I'm not stubborn. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Anu bil Muhammad. Jazakallah khairan. Barak lo fiq. Question. I have a question. 
اه تفضل Well, what the, what the contemporary scholars have, have generally said is that the bathrooms that we have now, where there's a sink, there's a bathtub, there's a toilet, there's all of these things in one, in one place. They say that basically the place that you were in and how you conduct yourself is going to be governed by your niya. So when I enter what's what we would call what the restroom or the bathroom, I enter to make wudu. Okay? I come into this place which has a toilet, has a bathtub, it has a sink, and I enter with the intention of what? Making wudu. I say what? Bismillah. I enter it with the intention of making what? Al ghusl. So I'm going to get in the bathtub and I'm going to make a ghusl, a complete bath. And when we make ghusl, it's front, it's, it's mustahab, it's recommended that we begin the ghusl with what? Bismillah. So I say Bismillah. But if I enter the bathroom to use what? The toilet. In that case, what? I don't speak. Just like it's from the adab of going to the bathroom that we don't, we don't speak. So I treat the place that I enter according, and I act according to what? My intention from entering. Make sense? Play. Any other question? Can you shake? Yes. Ah, the father is do you have a class next Monday? Ah, thank you for saying that. Yeah, next Monday uh, I'll be traveling. I won't be in town. So there won't be any class. So I won't be in town. So uh, we'll suspend the class for one week and then we'll resume the week after. Allah is